All right. So um, today in this talk, we're going to be talking about, you know, why do LSG trips last so long? And we'll have to go through a bit of molecular pharmacology to understand that, but I promise we'll make it hopefully easy to understand and digest. So the topics we'll have to talk about in understanding why LSD trips last so long is first we'll talk about the structure of LSD. I will spend a considerable amount of time talking about the biochemistry of LSD, and then we'll finally talk about why do LSD trips last for 10 to 12 hours. So first off, the structure of LSD, you can think about LSD as being two separate um, parts of a molecule. In blue is called lysergic acid, which is why LSD sometimes in the street terms is referred to as acid. Then in red, there is this part of the molecule called the diethylamide part of the molecule. And we'll talk about these as arms later in the discussion. In three dimensions, LSD has this structure. Um, I spent a lot of time studying organic chemistry and I always hated how we couldn't see molecules in three dimensions. And now I'm able to do that and I love it. But anyways, so if we take LSD and rotate it by um, 90 degrees and it's three dimensional structure, we can see that in the top part, there's this blue, uh, it's a nitrogen atom. Then there's these two, eth there's two ethyl groups, which are two carbon chains coming off. And they sort of look like arms. If I were to take my left arm, put it down, my right arm, put it up, it'd kind of be like that. They kind of go opposite to one of another. And then if we turn the molecule another 90 degrees, we can see it from the other side, and then we can put the molecule back into its original position. So a two-dimensional representation of the molecule, and then on the right, a three-dimensional representation of the molecule. So in the 1950s, when people were first understanding the mechanism of action of LSD, they realized something quite interesting. The following, they realized that LSD has a structural similarity to a neurotransmitter inside of our brain that is produced naturally. And this neurotransmitter is serotonin. In pink outlined is the common feature of these structures, which is called a tryptamine backbone. It really drove the idea that, you know, if LSD has a structure like serotonin, it probably binds to the same receptor to elicit its mechanism of action as serotonin. And this was proven to be true. There's also another uh, common drug that also has this tryptamine backbone, and that is the compound psilocin, which is a metabolite of psilocybin, which comes from uh, psychedelic mushrooms. So we'll go over what's called drug receptor binding with some fun analogies, hopefully. So when I say the word receptor for now, I want you guys to think about a baseball glove, something that catches something. And I want you to think about a drug as a baseball. And in order to catch a baseball on a baseball glove, you have to sort of point your hand up and let it kind of fall in. And in this state where the drug is not inside of the pocket of the baseball glove, that is the unbound state of the actual drug. If the drug isn't bound to the receptor or in the pocket of the baseball glove, it's not gonna have a mechanism of action. You know, being that you're not gonna be tripping from that sort of thing. The drug is free floating, it has to actually bind to the receptor to have a uh, psychedelic effect. In this state, the drug is bound to the receptor. The baseball is inside of the baseball glove, and at this point, you would experience psychedelic effects. Key point, baseball has to be inside of the baseball glove or the drug has to be inside of the receptor in order to have the drug have an effect. But that's not what a receptor really looks like. So here's this very scary image of what a receptor actually looks like. It's essentially just a really complicated baseball glove. Use that analogy throughout to remind yourself that it's just a very compli complicated baseball glove. And if you're totally confused right now, that is totally okay. Basically what a receptor is in a molecular sense, it's a, it's a collection of a bunch of different amino acids. Okay, the, probably the most common amino acid you guys have heard of is probably tryptophan. This gets sort of the, the Thanksgiving turkey analogy a lot of the times in uh, North America. But in each and every one of these positions, you can have a different amino acid, which makes up of a receptor. Uh, for example, this structure has about 420 amin different amino acids. There's a much simpler way that biochemists like to look at receptors. And this is the picture on the right. Uh, this is called an alpha helical representation. 
essentially, basically, these spaghetti, the spaghetti, corkscrew spaghetti shaped things are called alpha helices. And it's basically the picture on the left and the picture on the right are just a different representation of the same thing. The picture on the right is a little bit easier to understand because it doesn't have all these uh, molecules in the way. It's just explained by these structures called alpha helices. And we can spin that all the way around by 360 degrees to see what that looks like in a three-dimensional space. So we have this receptor that we've been talking about or this baseball glove, and there are different baseballs that can fit inside of a baseball glove. This one is LSD, this one is psilocin, and this one is serotonin. And the question that we try to answer as biochemist or chemist is basically, where exactly do these drugs bind to on the receptors? I.e., you know, out of this whole receptor or baseball glove, where does each one of these drugs or baseballs fit in? So uh, recently, I'll say 2017, about three years ago, there was a publication put out by uh, the David, David Nichols and Brian Roth and a, a bunch of other people where they figured out where exactly LSD binds to the receptor. Specifically, this is called a serotonin 2B receptor. Um, much like apples, there aren't just apples, there are different types of apples like a Honeycrisp, a Gala, and my favorite being the Pink Lady Apple. Uh, there are also different types of serotonin receptors, much like there are different types of apples. This one is specifically, like I said, a serotonin 2B receptor. And there it is in 360 degrees. Uh, this representation of it, I kind of changed the representations a lot to talk about different points. But in the picture on the left, you'll notice the drug is represented by these bluish balls and then these whiter circles. In this representation, we can actually see every atom in the LSD molecule. So just once again, a different representation of the same thing, the LSD molecule. If we kind of zoom in on the uh, binding site, of where LSD fits inside of the receptor. This is the bird's eye view of the top of the actual receptor itself. And if you kind of notice, there's this blue, dark blue, uh, it's called a nitrogen atom. And those arms that we talked about are pointing opposite of one another, kind of like this. If you take your left arm, put it down, your right arm, put it up. That's kind of how that part of the molecule orients itself which we'll, what we'll see is quite interesting and why that's, um, why that's so important in the LSD binding mode. So specifically, you might be wondering, in the, in the pictures I showed before, you just saw LSD as this free-floating molecule inside of a receptor. And you might be wondering, well, how does it actually, like, what does it interact with? How does it just sit inside there? It's not, it's not magic, right? And it's not. Basically, what happens there are these interacting, there are these, there are these forces that interact between uh, the drug LSD and um, specific amino acids within the receptor, much like how a magnet, like two magnets, you can have them um, come towards each other and be attracted to one another to, um, to attract things. Specifically, in this case, this white thing is a, a hydrogen and it has a positive charge. And this red thing is called an oxygen molecule and it has a negative charge. And when a positive charge and a negative charge in chemistry meet each other, they tend to, they tend to like each other. They tend to be attracted to one another. So it's really that attractive force between different atoms um, in the drug and amino acids in the receptor that holds things in place, like a magnet. And the other interaction is called is aspartic acid. And it has a similar interaction with the white hydrogen atom and the red oxygen, which are a positive and a negative charge and like each other, so they come together. I found something quite interesting that I hadn't included earlier, but um, I was doing some work and um, I was looking into the different interacting amino acid residues. This is a two-dimensional representation of the amino acid residues and um, LSD is in the middle. and what you'll notice is there's something quite interesting. So there's the hydro, the thing we talked about with glycine. There's this thing with aspartic acid. There's an attractive force. There's also one more attractive force with this thing called phenylalanine. And if you look at psilocin, 
um, the compound, the psychedelic compound that comes from psilocybin and magic mushrooms, it actually fits inside the receptor in a, a very similar way. It has the same exact attractive forces that hold it into place. It's got the glycine, it has the aspartic acid interaction, and it's got this phenylalanine interaction. I found that quite interesting. So it really, it really proves that you need this sort of tryptamine uh, structure to fit inside the receptor in this way in order for these drugs to work. Okay, there's a concept in pharmacology known as affinity and more of a complex definition. It's the strength of an interaction between a drug and a receptor. Let's use the following analogy to try and understand this thing called affinity. I remember playing with these toys as maybe when I was seven or eight years old where they have a, a Velcro surface. And if you take a tennis ball and uh, throw it at the Velcro surface, it sticks really well to that Velcro surface. And in order to actually remove the tennis ball, you have to grab the ball and rip it off. Um, and we would say that because the tennis ball sticks well to the surface, we call this in pharmacology a high affinity interaction. Meaning that, for example, if a drug were to go inside of a receptor and it were to stick really well, we would call that a high affinity interaction. On the contrary, if I take a tennis racket and I you know, hit a tennis ball with it and or somebody throws a tennis ball towards a tennis racket, it would bounce right off. There's no stickiness associated with that interaction. We would say the tennis ball bounces off of the surface and we would call this a low affinity interaction. It turns out you can actually measure this thing called affinity with different drugs and different receptors. So let's take a look at this. We'll find something quite interesting here. If we look at the LSD molecule on the bottom, we see these values listed um, on this column. We see 5-HT means serotonin. Uh, and then the subtypes of receptor, much like the apple analogy where, you know, you have different types of apples, you have different types of serotonin receptors. They're denoted by this 1A, this 2A, 2B, 2C, and so on, but they're all subtypes of a serotonin receptor. But the idea being that with affinity, the lower the value or closer to zero, it means that it has a higher affinity interaction towards the receptor. And then if we go across the board, we can see that there's the 2A interaction, 2B and 2C. So if you want to figure out which, um, which uh, subtype of receptor LSD has the highest affinity for, just look for the value that's closer to zero. And that's gonna stick well, stick better to that receptor. In this case, it's the, the 2A receptor. LSD is known as being a serotonin 2A agonist, meaning it binds really well and really tightly to the serotonin 2A receptor but it also does have action at the 2B, the 2C, and the, the 1A. What's even more mind-blowing is that if you look at the top part of this, there's a thing that says 5-HT. So now we're looking at the affinity of serotonin to serotonin receptor. And if you remember what I said about the number being closer to zero, a number closer to zero denotes a, a higher affinity interaction. So we could actually look at these numbers and compare the affinity of LSD compared to serotonin. And what we would see is that for every subtype of receptor that we measure with LSD, it has a higher affinity than serotonin itself. The most starkly uh, ones that jump out at me is the affinity of uh, LSD versus serotonin at the 2A receptor. This is about 160 times stronger. LSD has a binds to serotonin receptor by about 160 times stronger than serotonin itself, which is pretty crazy to me. And that the 2B it binds, binds about 12 times stronger. Okay, something more about LSD in terms of how it binds to the receptor. We talked about earlier that LSD has these two parts. Uh, the blue part is the lysergic acid part of the molecule, and the red part is the diethyl amide part of the molecule. Um, this is a picture from the Netflix series Lock and Key, which I personally enjoyed very much, but we'll use an analogy to explain something here. So in this analogy, think about a drug as a key and a receptor as a keyhole. And from intuition, we've all used, we've all used keys to open doors. We know that you have to take a key, stick it inside of a keyhole, but in order to actually open the door or unlock, you have to actually turn the key, don't you? 
LSD does sort of a similar thing as we'll see. So on the left, what this is, is this is LSD's three-dimensional shape when it is not inside of a receptor. Specifically highlighted in blue is the diethyl amide part of the molecule or those arms that we talked about as being up and down. When LSD binds to the receptor, the diethyl amide part of the molecule actually changes conformation. So the analogy here being that the diethyl amide rotates upon, upon binding, much like when you stick a key into a lock, you have to turn the key in order to actually open the lock, don't you? Sort of a similar mechanism going on there. Okay, so to figure this out, this might be a little bit, um, this will be interesting. So scientists want to figure out, is the orientation of that diethyl amide group important? So what they did is they looked at the three-dimensional conformation of these, those arms that we talked about. In LSD and purple, the arms are sort of like this in three-dimensional space. Um, you can make this compound uh, SSAZ uh, in, in uh, green, in which you can force the arms to be in the same position as LSD, okay? You can then make this compound called RRAZ and force the arms to be in the opposite configuration. So basically going like from this to this. And then in LSA, you, it's like you don't have any arms at all. There are no arms really in this molecule. And it turns out you can measure the activity of these compounds um, at serotonin 2B receptor. So what we're trying to look at here in this graph is if we follow the, let's follow the purple line because that's LSD. The purple line starts and then as the concentration of the drug increases, the receptor activity also increases until we hit a, a top part. And what's interesting is if you look at the green compound, it tracks perfectly basically with the purple line, telling us that the arm position being conserved in this SSAZ compound, um, it, it does show the same activity as LSD. But if you look at the RRAZ compound in red, you actually need more drug to achieve the same effect as LSD. So basically what this tells us is that the conformation of those arms, it does matter. And it's part of the reason why LSD is a really potent compound. And then why do LSD trips last so long? To our final topic of discussion. So in terms of LSD trips um, lasting long, this came out of, I regenerated this diagram from the, the Nichols paper about the uh, crystal structure or the serotonin receptor structure. So what they found is this thing sort of, we'll call it a molecular lid, so to speak. It's literally like a lid. So sort of what happens is when LSD takes its key, puts it inside of the keyhole or receptor, it turns the diethyl amide, so it turns the key, and then this lid sort of shuts down on the drug. It's a molecular lid that closes after all that binding occurs. And Specifically, there's a specific amino acid residue called leucine at the 209th position that sort of wedges LSD down into the receptor, forcing it to stay inside the receptor and making it really hard for LSD to escape the receptor. So, of course, we need to prove that this is a real thing. So, what this is trying to show in this gray gray diagram called wild type. This is the normal uh, leucine at the 209th position of the uh, serotonin 2B receptor. And what they did is they actually took the lid and they modeled it in molecular modeling software and showed over time the change in how much the lid is moving from left to right and left to right. And you can track those changes of how much the lid is actually moving. And there's not that much movement in the lid, but in the picture in red, if you take that amino acid called leucine and you mutate it to a different amino acid called alanine, you actually see there's more movement in the lid. The lid moves more. So theoretically, this mutation, if you have this mutated receptor, the LSD would get kicked out of the receptor much sooner and the psychedelic effect wouldn't last as long as the normal uh, receptor with leucine at that position. And it turns out they can prove this. So what we're looking at on the, uh, the x-axis is a time scale. And then on the y-axis, we're looking at 
how much LSD is bound to the receptor over time. In the black line, what we see if we follow this line is that as time goes on, the LSD gets kicked out of the receptor, okay? At some rate, and that rate is this number right here, 0 0.005. And then if we do the same thing, we look at uh, the mutated receptor, which has alanine at that position. We see that the concentration of drug drops way faster with the mutated receptor, showing us that if we mutate the receptor, the LSD will actually get kicked out of it at a much quicker rate. So this, this mutation, for example, if somebody had this mutation, your LSD trip would be about uh, four times less than, uh, than LSD with the normal receptor. So case in point showing us that the amino acid at this specific position acts as a wedge to hold LSD inside the receptor, making the trip quite, quite long. Um, if the concentration never decreases, you would just trip forever, which wouldn't be a good thing. We wouldn't want that. So the major outcomes of this paper or this talk is that LSD forms these two hydrogen bonds with serotonin 2B receptor. Um, and it was the same types of interactions with uh, psilocin, which is interesting. And that we talked about the diethyl amide greatly contributes to the potency of the serotonin uh, 2B receptor, which we saw when we changed those arms from this direction to this direction, you needed a lot more drug to achieve the same effect. And then we talked about how this leucine amino acid on the molecular lid of the uh, serotonin 2B receptor traps LSD inside the receptor, which explains why LSD's uh, experience is generally very long. And specifically that amino acid um, leucine forces it to stay down inside the receptor. And the type of work I do, it's, you know, we want to be able to, we can look at this research and we can design new psychedelic drugs which, you know, we want to make sure they satisfy these criteria because we saw that, you know, both LSD is a psychedelic and so is uh, psilocin, and they both have similar types of interactions with amino acid residues. And that is it. All right, so we have a couple of questions from the audience. Sure. Um, so one of the first ones was, given the difference in binding affinity of LSD between 2B and 2A, is it yeah. correct to generalize its diethylamide rotation in 2B to its behavioral effects mediated primarily through 2A? Um, so because they're, in my world, technically, that is, that's a good question, but it's unknown because there isn't a serotonin 2A receptor structure known with LSD bound to it. So like, I think it's a really good question. Um, people seem to think, yes, the answer is that, is LSD's primary effect of being a psychedelic is mediated by it binding to the 2A uh, receptor, but I think we would need that crystal stru that structure to say for sure, yeah. All right, we also have like a, a couple of other questions. So in regards to the proof slide with the uh, cap rotation, do you know sure. how this relates to the rapid tolerance seen in serotonergic psychedelics? And is tolerance believed to be due to receptor desensitization? That's, that's actually correct. Yeah, so tolerance, so the idea behind tolerance is, is it is due to receptor desensitization. Specifically after a drug binds to a receptor, um, what happens more specifically is the, the cell actually internalizes the receptor Meaning it, meaning it drags it into the surface of the cell and that helps degrade the drug. Um, that's, that's kind of the general model for desensitization. And what was the next part of the question? Um, the is tolerance believed to be due to receptor desensitization? Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 it is, yeah. The very general answer is yes, yeah. And is there a reason why Nichols' research focuses on LSD's activity in the 5-HT2B receptor mm -hmm. and not the 5A, oh, sorry, and not the 2A? Yeah, a lot of, so here's the, this is a good question. Um, the serotonin 2A crystal structure paper is actually supposed to come out this year, hopefully. Um, what happened was I was talking to Nichols about this in person, and he said it was very hard for them to get the structure of the 2A receptor. Primarily, his lab does study serotonin at the 2A receptor, but it was so hard for them to get a crystal structure, uh, the structure of 
the 2A receptor. They went after the 2B receptor. It was easier to get that, that structure for. But yeah, hopefully we'll see some more information with the 2A uh, structure coming out soon. But um, in terms of the differences between the two receptors, they're apparently, they're very similar. If you look at the, the what's called the sequence homology, um, the amino acid residues almost exactly line up between the two receptors. Um, there are very slight differences that don't really affect that active site, so to speak. All right, um, so another question. While LSD has a long residence time within the 5-HG receptor as a result of this extracellular loop lid mechanism, does this actually affect the downstream signaling pathways more than a different 5-HG2A agonist? And the second uh, part of the question yeah. is, once the G-protein signaling uh, molecule has been released, can the receptor be reset and signal again while LSD is still bound? And somebody knows their pharmacology. Just just summarize the first part one more. I'll answer each part separately. Yes, uh, the first part um, is while LSD has a long resi residence time within the 5-HG receptor as a result of this extracellular loop lid mechanism, yeah. does this actually affect the downstream signaling pathways more than a different 5-HT2A agonist? The, an the answer is yes. Um, the answer is quite complicated, but basically the idea is that drugs and receptors aren't stagnant when they interact with each other. Both the drug and the receptor changes shapes, and it has been shown that in very new research that um, psychedelics specifically are beta arrestin bias, and if you use something like, um, not serotonin, but psilocin, uh, psilocin isn't as beta arrestin bias. Um, it's more cyclic AMP bias, but LSD is, and it's because of that diethyl amide part that it tends to be more beta arrestin bias. That's a that's a whole other talk, though, if you ever want to cover that. It's an interesting. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And the second you know part. The, sorry, yeah. Did you uh, want it to answer the part two of that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It says, once the G protein signaling molecule has been released, can the receptor be reset and signal again while LSD is still bound? Uh, no, the drug would actually have to get kicked out of the receptor for the recycling to occur. Um, it gets it gets internalized into the cell, which means the cell sucks it in. And then once it's inside of there, the drug gets kicked out of the receptor, then it can be reused. It has to come out first. Okay. We have a couple more questions and then we're probably going to close it off. Sure. Uh, does LSD have any affinity for dopamine receptors as compared it, to other classical yeah. psychedelics? It, um, it does. LSD, Nichols always said this in his talks, that LSD is quite a promiscuous molecule, meaning that it binds to a lot of different receptors. Dopamine is one of them, but the affinity is not very high. Um, most of the psychedelic drugs are mediated by um, serotonin binding. It, it's pretty low at dopamine, I know, and there's also the, the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, but I'd say like in terms of this, it's, 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 it's a bit negligible, but is there a pharmacological effect there? Yes, there is. Yeah. Okay. What role does the carbonyl group near the diethyl arms play in affinity? It isn't necessary for psilocybin, but it, but is it necessary for LSD? Yeah. Let's take a look. Maybe we'll go to the picture. So someone's asking about the carbonyl group. Okay. Um. Honestly, like when I've looked at this inside the receptor, I haven't seen any interactions with the carbonyl group that basically being the C double bond O, somebody wants to know if it has any sort of effects with the receptor. The answer is no, not really. Yeah. Um, as far as I can tell, there's not really much interaction. The most important part is the, um, the indole ring, which has the hydrogen bond here, um, this nitrogen here, um, this interaction and then the uh, diethyl am, but it seems like not much other part of the molecule has much of an effect. But we could test it, we could build another molecule, right? And do we know if the LEU209 has any relation to uh, hallucinogen persisting perception disorder? That's, a, that's, that's definitely a question that I, I do not know. Let me think about that. Does leucine 209 have any? That's a good question that I don't have the answer to, to be honest. And uh, last question, what accounts for some people who are not able to get an effect from LSD? Is it a problem with their receptors? 
You would have, yeah. So I, I guess you, what you would imagine is that there are definitely some people that need really high doses of um, high doses of LSD to have an effect. Um, people that would need a really high dose likely would have like lots and lots of ser. Actually, sorry, they'd have not. They'd have lower amounts of serotonin receptor um, than somebody who has the opposite effect. It, it would probably be a, a problem of like either having you know, on one side, if you have not a lot of serotonin receptor or having like too much serotonin receptor, I guess if that makes sense. Yep, and uh, that's all the questions. Thank you.